Good morning. Welcome out to church, everybody. It's good to see everybody here. And, and um, we have some uh, prayer announcements here. I just have some really good news to report, sad news uh, this week. Uh, but some great news is Ty Clancy. Last Saturday, he tried to start a stove, wood stove for his dad. And uh, he used an accelerant, and that had actually exploded. And he burnt the inside of his lungs and his mouth, and they... Mom brought him to the hospital, then they brought him to Duluth, and he was on life support. They didn't know if he was going to pull through Sunday night. And uh, they talked, I went down there Monday, and I talked to Shane and Carol Ann, and they said it was going to be a long road. They said it was going to be probably a month on life support. They didn't know how extensive the damage was in the lungs. And uh, we get a call Friday. Uh, I talked to her every day, but Friday she called, and she said, well, he ties being naughty. They're bringing him off the life sport, and he's ripping off, all, ripping out all the cords. And and actually, uh, so good news. The kid's got some fight in him. He's off life support. He's off the ventilator. And uh, tell me, there's not power in prayer. I mean, it is by God's will, God's grace, that this kid is alive, and he's completely healthy, and will be home hopefully soon. But uh, thank God, he's off the the vent. Um, so remember that family in prayer. Chris Giffen, just remember her in prayer. She's uh, going through uh, some personal with some medical stuff. So I'll just pray that uh, she's doing well today, I heard, right? Yeah. Yep. So we want to continue to pray for her. The Philippines reached out to them. I know everybody helped uh, a couple weekends ago give some money to specifically for that. We do send them money. Uh, we know they were going through the, uh, the typhoon over there. Many dead, but the people that we know and... Uh, are safe, they're secure, they're thankful for the money, the people that have helped them, and uh, just uh, wonderful people over there, so we just need to continue to pray for the gospel to, con be, to be continued to be spread over there, because typhoons will come and go, and it's where you spend the eternity is where, where it counts. Um, I had Jeremy and Kendra, a friend of Ronnie and Shirley's, we've been praying for them, their baby had passed, I believe it was Thursday night, and they're still in the, I believe they're still in the cities, and uh, they will be home this week, it appears, and we'll probably be doing the service. Now, I haven't talked to them, but uh, it might be here. I, I don't know. I don't even want to say a date yet, but uh, I'll talk to Jeremy and Kendra, and we'll try to work something out. Terry and Joanne, it's been a couple of tough weeks for them. Terry had MRI on his brain, cancer, and he had a PET scan last week. They will know the results this week, stage four brain cancer. Doctor originally gave him six months to live. If he did nothing, two we, two years, if he tried to fight it. So this week is a, a big week for them. So let's pray for them this week. And I know people have been praying, but we pray that the the will of God, the grace of God, is answering these prayers, answering these prayers, and that the glory of Jesus Christ is definitely being celebrated through this. And somebody is getting saved through this uh, incident with Terry and Joanne. Willie, stage three and a half, Will, lung cancer. We need to continue to pray for Willie. He's out at the deer camp, and he's enjoying, enjoying the time that he has with his friends. And he says he has many friends that go to mainstream religions, and he's bringing all these tracks. And he says they are going to hear the gospel this weekend. 
He says, they're going to listen to me. So, <laughs> uh, And then our friend, dear friend, Ron Hines. Uh, we wanted to continue to pray for Ron. He's going through his treatment right now for thyroid. And uh, just continue to pray for Shirley to have patience with him and that all continues to go well. Pray for Mike S. and Mary for salvation. Uh, we definitely need to pray that they hear people hear a clear gospel, but we're praying for these two. We know they're hearing a clear gospel. We just need to pray that they would open their ears and hear uh, about God's grace. And then we have Kayla Latfila that had an eight-pound baby boy, and his name is Lake Dean. And uh, Armando has a brother. So, yes. So, pretty good, some great stuff going on this week, some tough stuff, but definitely answered prayer. Is there any other prayer requests this morning? All right, let's open a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, first of all, we just want to thank you for your grace. You are the God of all grace. And we know that you demonstrated your love and that you went to the cross and you paid that payment for sin for us. You died, you were buried, and you rose again the third day, showing us the payment for sin has been paid in full. And Father, will you give us eternal life, the gift of eternal life, that we'll forever be with you, that we can never lose it when we believe the gospel, that you died on the cross, were buried, and paid for our sins in full. And we receive this amazing gift. Eternal life is a positional thing. We are in you. We're forever your son. We become a son. And we have this eternal inheritance in heaven, this kingdom that is heaven for us that you've given us, forever in presence with you. And we just thank you for your grace. We could never earn it. We never could des we surely don't deserve it. We know exactly what we deserve. But we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And Father, we have some prayer requests this week, and we want to pray for Jeremy and Kendra. We know that David, when he was fasting there, and his head, he had committed adultery and committed murder with Bathsheba there, and he fasted for the week, and he prayed, and this and that. But ultimately, when the baby died, David got up, he quit fasting, he washed, and he ate. And the people, were, the, the people around him were questioning, what's going on? And David said, I sh he shall not come to me, but I shall go to him. And Father, we thank you for the scriptures that reveal to us that we have all of our children, and we know we have other people here in the church that have lost a child, but all babies go to heaven. They're, they're forever in heaven, and we'll forever be with them in heaven when we get to see our babies, our children, my sister, and we thank you for the beautiful scripture. And my father, I thank you for Ty, Ty Clancy. And we know that uh, I have no idea how extensive the, the damage that, that was done into the lungs, but it is by your grace, your will, you healed this young kid and you brought him off the life support far beyond what the doctors ex exceeded there. And you delivered him through the dark night there and on Saturday night. And, and uh, you, it is your will working through this kid and that family. And Father, we're just so thankful for the Clancy family. We know the kids come to camp, and we're just thankful that you kept them safe. And we just hopefully, through this process, maybe somebody got saved there, Father. Again, Father, you know the needs and the wants of the people here. And we just, again, ask that you be with our brother, Ronnie, Terry, and other men and women that might be fighting cancer, fighting for their lives. But it is your will, Father. So, Father, we just ask, that, again, that you would bless the message today. Bless the people here in Christ's name. Amen. Do we have any birthdays this week? Got one right there. My son, Zach. Zach. Zach's birthday. Happy birthday, Zach. We got one back here. All right, we'll sing. Oh, we got one in the front row, too. Gabriel. It's your mom's birthday today? Michelle. Oh, okay. Michelle's birthday? Okay. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. Anniversaries. Going once, going twice. We will turn over to page 60 and we will sing all verses.
256, verses 1 and 4. To know our burdens are lifted at Calvary is a beautiful and great song. To know that we can spend eternity with Him, not for what we've done, but for what He has done for us. Just want to some quick announcements here. Just want to thank Pastor Tom. Uh, last uh, Sunday speaking here, and and uh, it's just uh, his messages. If you're not listening to Pastor Tom's radio messages, again, I got. Uh, their email address down here, God's Perfect Love, last week. Uh, just a great message on grace. 
listened to it this morning on the way here, and, and it was very, very good. Um, I want to thank the people that participated in Bible study last Wednesday. I brought a friend, and, and uh, you know, he, he got in the truck with me, and he said, really like the people there. He says, you know, it was very non-judgmental, very loving group of people, and, and that's what it's about. It's about uh, coming here, being able to talk about some of the tough things and, and uh, having fellowship on the foundation of Christ. But it's not what people look like. It's not what people wear. We don't care what people drive. It's about people being accepted for who they are. They're God's creation. We welcome them in, them, welcome them in and we share the gospel, and hopefully people believe. So what a great blessing that uh, he had shared with me, and I uh, thought I would share it with all of you because he said thanks, thanks for uh, inviting them out to Bible study. Playboy Roller Rink Youth Group. This, this Saturday, I believe it is, at uh, 5 to 7, we rented the Playmore Roller Rink. So we encourage all families to come out. If you uh, are not a member of the church, or it doesn't matter if your grandkid, your grandchild can come and be part of it. Uh, we encourage moms and dads to come in here, what, what the lessons being taught to the kids. And... We're Angela. Who's speaking this week? Dennis? We don't know yet. Yeah, Dennis, you ready? <laughs> Anyways, uh, we got the New Year's Eve lock-in, but we have the roller rink. We're having a youth group meeting after church today. So if you want to be part of the youth group, please stick around, and we're going to have a meeting right after church today. We have the New Year's Eve lock-in Christmas Eve. Uh, some upcoming events, Christmas play. I'll have it typed in there next week, but we have Christmas play December 22nd at 1 o'clock. We'll have church that Sunday morning. We'll do uh, get ready for the play, get set up. We'll do potluck starting at 1 o'clock. So if you want to leave for a little bit, then come back. But it, uh, a lot of the little kids get tired through the day, and the evening is tough on the little kids. So invite your friends and family out to come. And some of the people that have attended like Fritz Grossman, he attended the first uh, Christmas play. That actually is what started him coming to the church here. So it's everything that we do. Some people are attracted to certain things, but he heard the plan of salvation, and he said, that's the church I'm going to be part of. So the Christmas play, potluck first, 1 o'clock. And the baked goods, we had a sign-up sheet in the back. Rachel just put another sign-up sheet in the back for rotation. So if you have any questions about who is to bring what cookies, which week, the list is on the back, who is responsible for what week. Is there any other announcements this week? Yes, Angela. If you didn't hear that, they need chaperones. Zach, that will be good for you. 20 years old, I know he wants to be on a lock-in on New Year's Eve. <laughs> Jessa, you too. <laughs> Happy birthday, kid. All right, let's do our last song. We'll have all the kids come up. It'll be uh, page 226. We'll sing the first verse twice.
All right, if you turn your Bible over to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. Today's message is the God of all grace. What an amazing piece of scripture. We know he, he is the father of mercy. He's the father of hope, father of comfort, father of peace. We know those are pieces of scripture. And here we read in 1 Peter chapter 5, he is the God of all grace. And I'll read the scriptures here. It says, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And I would encourage you to study the scriptures. And if you're going through any type of suffering, and if you're looking for hope, suffering, you know, we know that Peter wrote to the Jews that were dispersed through uh, the uh, Asia Minor there in Cappadocia and, and part of Turkey, present day Turkey there. And it was to know that their suffering will only be temporary. I have this little handout here. And so many times we come here and every week we hear about cancer. And sometimes I think we give too much to cancer. We give cancer too much strength. I went down to the Duth Bible Conference and what an amazing, Pastor Dennis was an uh, amazing guy. And, and this is one of the handouts uh, 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 I took. It was a free and it says, What cancer cannot do. Cancer is so limited. It cannot cripple love. It cannot shatter hope. It cannot corrode faith, it cannot eat away peace, it cannot destroy confidence, it cannot kill friendships, it cannot shut out memories, it cannot silence courage, it cannot reduce eternal life, it cannot quench the spirit, it cannot lessen the power of the resurrection. That is a prayer or a poem that by an anonymous author. And grace is such a wonderful thing. But if you are suffering, you know somebody's going through suffering, I would encourage you to read First Peter. And you know what? Hope. You want to read a book about hope? Read Titus. Because hope means that we, we rest in the promises that God gives. That's what hope is. It's not like, I hope tomorrow comes. Hope is an eternal, eternal assurance. It's a guaranteed rest because I know God is always going to promise. He says, I believe I receive eternal life. That is the hope I put in Christ Jesus. So today's message is going to be about grace. We might touch Ephesians a little bit. We're obviously walking through the book of Ephesians. But sometimes I wonder if we or if the people on the, the TV or you know the Philippines really understand what grace is. So we're going to hit grace. And if you understand what grace is, I'll give you an acronym what grace is. G, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace really means. God's riches at Christ's expense. And the reason I am struggling with this, and it's been on me, my mind, for a while, but I went on a website, and on this website, it actually talked about, oh, you can lose your salvation. And I struggle any time I hear that because I know, obviously, they do not understand what grace is. So we're going to walk and we're going to back things up scripturally. But what does grace really mean? So we should turn, you know, and let me describe this. It means unmerited favor. See, we work every week. At the end of the week, we get a paycheck. That's merited favor. You're working for this paycheck. Unmerited means you cannot earn it. It's an undeserved favor, undeserved kindness. You don't deserve it. See, we have no idea how holy God is. And if you read over in Isaiah chapter 6, we have the seraphim that have the six wings. And two of them cover their feet, and two of them cover their eyes. And the, and the, and the other two, they're flying. And they say, holy, holy, holy. I don't think we have a clue how holy God is, how just He is, how perfect He really is. But man, in our ultimate wisdom, we often think we can bring God a little bit lower and us a little bit higher, and then ultimately maybe we can get there or at least hold on to it. He is holy. 
You could never earn it and you could never deserve it. You don't deserve it, but someone has done something on your behalf. This is what grace is. God has something done on your behalf, done something on your behalf. We talked a little bit about cancer. Maybe if you had cancer, or maybe you know somebody, but I'm going to use me. I have cancer. And my son took my cancer from me. But ultimately, when he takes my cancer, he dies. That's grace. I don't deserve it. That's an act of kindness. And that's exactly what Christ did. Now, if I be bad, does he give me that cancer back? No. How foolish is that? Or if I rebel or act out, is he going to say, oh, you get your cancer back? No, same thing with Christ. When he died on the cross, he took your cancer, your sin, and he died. And when you rebel as a child of God, he doesn't give it back. You're perfect in position, and we've explained that numerous times. We're in the body of Christ. We have his righteousness, was a couple weeks ago. But turn over to Titus. Titus 3. If you don't have these scriptures, I would definitely write them down or read or follow along. Go home and read them again. And I'm not that bright. I could never make up some of these wonderful words here. I'm just blessed to be able to even read these words. Titus 3, verse 4. It says, but after that, the kindness. You want an example of what grace is? This is what grace is. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of the regeneration. If you listen to Tom's message, regeneration, you're born again, a renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the, the Holy Spirit of promise. You're reborn, a new creation within you, sealed until the day of redemption, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified by his grace. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Justified by his grace. See, I think Titus 3, verse 4 and 7 describes grace. God showed us his kindness to mankind by sending them a Savior. It is very clear we could never earn it, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It is very clear what Christ did for us. Christ died. He was buried, rose again the third day for the pain for sin. And when you believe this, you are born again. You're regenerated. A new creation with us, which is the Holy Spirit, sealing us with the promise for eternal glory with Him. It is very clear in the Scriptures, by grace are we saved. By grace are we to live. By grace we're disciplined. By grace we suffer and by grace, we have eternal life. Why are there so many churches out there? Why are there so many individuals preaching you can lose your eternal security? We just learned grace is something you cannot earn. It's unmerited favor, undeserved favor. You cannot earn it. And if you can never earn it, how could you ever lose it? It is not yours to earn. It is not yours to lose. Eternal life is a gift received when you believe. So, in, so many individuals want to confuse works and grace. Man likes to combine the two. I believe the Bible is very clear that these are separate, completely diametrically opposed, complete polar opposites. You cannot combine works and grace. It is completely physically impossible it is like oil and water i can put oil and water and i can shake it all i want but ultimately it may look like they're mixing together but ultimately they do not mix the particles of oil and water are continuously separated but man he'll do the same thing he'll try to mix it up and look like and mix these works and grace but it is really clear 
God says that they are separate. God and grace, works and grace are completely separate. How do I know this? I don't want you to believe me. I want you to believe the Bible. Because I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I want you to read the scriptures and find out for yourself. And I'm not going to try and confuse you or use some trick questions. I want you to read along with me and listen to these words. Turn over to Romans 11.6. Romans 11.6. And it says, if, and if by grace, unmerited favor, undeserved, can never earn it. And if it by grace, which then would be a gift, then it is no more of works. This is what the Bible says. If it's grace, it's not works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So if I had to actually say, oh, I could earn it or I can lose it, then it no longer is grace. It becomes a work. I'm holding on to it. I'm doing something for salvation. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Either you work for it or you don't. Don't confuse the two. Don't mix the two. It is one or the other. Call it the way it is. Call the kettle black. It's either grace or works. Are you trying to earn your salvation? You want to pay for your, because then you will go to hell and you'll pay for your sin for all eternity. Because God requires a death payment for sin. But if it be of works, then there's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. It's either grace or works. Turn back just a few pages to Romans 4.4. 4. Romans 4.4 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. We just said that. If you want to work for your salvation, you owe a payment. A death payment. The Old Testament is very clear. Payment for sin is a death payment. Deuteronomy, like the women, we're starting in John right now, and we have the woman at the well. And she had five husbands, and she was already with another husband. What should have happened to her? Samaritan woman should have been brought out and stoned. That's what should have happened. And nowhere in the scriptures do you see Jesus condemning her, and saying, you know, I'm going to take you out and stone you. Now, what does he offer? He offers her grace. So if you want to work for your salvation, you owe a debt. And that debt is owed when you go to hell and pay for that debt. You die forever. But then verse 5 is beautiful. It says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Remember, we were justified by grace. We believe, and then he's the one that justifies the ungodly. Our faith is counted for righteousness. So if you're listening right now and you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, I'd recommend you do so now. You don't have to get up. You don't have to come to the front of the church. You don't have to make Jesus Lord of your life. You don't have to give your life to Jesus. You're simply saved by grace through faith. This week I had a talking to a kid, and this kid was saying, oh, I, I gave my life to Jesus. And I'm like, what does that mean? What does it really mean? Couldn't really explain it. I go, why don't you just believe he goes, I believe, and then I go, why don't you just say that then? Say, I believe that Christ died on the cross. Because giving your life to Jesus, what does that really mean? Nowhere in the scriptures have I ever seen those words. But yet we have people doing it all the time. Because, you know, the spotlight just got switched. The spotlight got switched off the cross and off of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. And it got switched on me, me doing something. That is no longer grace. That's a work. I'm the one that's walking up to the front. I'm the one that's taking the glory from God. I made Jesus Lord of my life. That is a false doctrine. Christ Jesus went to the cross and died for you. He took your sins and he died for them all. He died for past, present, and future. He was buried and rose the third day for your sins. All you have to do is believe and he, that he died in your place. Put your trust in him. You have his Savior and his name is Jesus Christ. And he sits at the right hand of God as we speak. If you choose to not to do that, 
you will go to hell and pay for your sins. Now, I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher. I just preach the word of God. You can label it all you want, but I just read the word of God. Either you have eternal life or eternal torment. Those are the facts. It's external and internal torment. I think if you could go to hell for one second, you'd probably completely understand grace. Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. People in hell are believers right now. What happened to the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man said, send a man back and preach the gospel to my five brothers. He was saved. He's in hell and he believes. But you don't get a second chance. Hell is filled with believers. Look at Luke chapter 16 yourself. Read it. But it doesn't work this way. Hell is filled with believers. They are external torment, internal torment. And I'll explain the external torment. The fire never quenches. The tongue that never will forever quench thirst. And the internal torment of the worm never dieth. And I would say the worm that never dieth is you are forever in hell being reminded that you had a Savior and you rejected him. That's on you. See, we serve the God of all grace. So we've laid some foundation, but now let's go back to John. John 1. Who is grace and who is truth? See, we often say we're saved by grace, but really what does that mean? It means unmerited favor, undeserved, can never earn it. But what is grace? Who is grace? John 1, 14 and 17. Who is grace and truth? It is Jesus Christ. John 1, 14 and 15. And the word was made flesh. Who is the word? It is Jesus Christ. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. So this word is filled with grace and truth. 17. For the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. If you think you can earn salvation or have to be good for salvation, you don't know him. His name might roll across your lips, but you don't know him. You don't know him. Many claim to know him, throw his name around. But just like in John 1, 10 through 11, let's read John, 10, John 1, 10, 11. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They walked with him. They ate and talked with him. Maybe even bumped into him, touched him, and yet still rejected him. Many claim to know him, but they don't know him. If you have any confidence in self, any confidence in traditions, any confidence in sacraments for salvation, you are not saved. You're not. One must completely seize in trusting in self or other religious acts, righteous acts, completely trust on him. We are saved by grace. Saved by whom? By Christ. Whose grace? Grace, grace is Christ. Christ is grace. It is unmerited favor. You cannot earn it. You do not deserve it. Redemption is received when one believes the gospel. Christ has done it all. One has faith. The question is, so we're by grace, saved through faith. Okay, let's talk about faith. Where are you placing that object of faith? Am I like putting it in that pew to save me? What is the object of that faith? Am I putting my faith in myself or some act to achieve salvation or is, it by, or is my object of faith on him? The one and true God who is alive and sits at the right hand of God today. Turn over to Hebrews 2, 9. Now I love a grace message. I honestly probably could listen to a grace message every single day because that's what it's about. That's what we live by. It's how we're disciplined. It's how we're, we suffer. And ultimately, it's how we receive eternal life. It is grace living. It's all about grace. It's how we are saved. But here we have a verse, beautiful verse. It says, but we see Jesus. 
who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he may he that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. He died for you and me. It was by the grace of God. See, we deserve to go to hell. And the next time you're mad at God, the next, the next time you're having, you know, why aren't things just going my way? And maybe you start demanding, Lord, I need a little more in my life. I deserve more. I'm faithful. I go to church every Sunday. I read my Bible. I'm fellowship with you. I deserve more. Come on, give me. I want some of these riches that you promised to me in heaven, some of these rewards that you promised me in heaven. I want to start seeing some of those rewards here on earth. Just remember this. You deserve hell. And we were saved from hell. Remember when Christ said, my grace is sufficient enough. 2 Corinthians 12 to 12, read it about Paul. My grace is sufficient enough. Lean on him. He will take care of his children. Where is your object of faith that is in Christ Jesus or something else? And we as men, I can only speak for myself, and oftentimes I put this, oh, the strength and trust into my own merit, not for salvation, but even the truth through trials and tribulations through life. I can do this. I can take care of this. I'll fix this. And that's what we've been studying Galatians and Ephesians all about. It's getting our mind off ourselves and on to Christ depending on him. And this has nothing to do with salvation. This is about for the believer, if you're saved, that's who I'm talking to. Keeping your mind on Christ. Why is grace important to understand? Sin had entered through Adam. Sin had entered through Adam, and then it was imputed upon us from birth, born sinners. So you receive this sin. It's imputation. It's placed upon you. You're born with it. See, either you have the imputation of Adam or you have the imputation of Christ. So sin had entered through Adam and passed on to all since that time. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what Romans 3.23 tells us. No matter how good you be. Let's, let me give you an example of this. For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Romans, John chapter 3, Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, he was a leader amongst the Pharisees, he was a teacher amongst the Pharisees. This man knew the Bible inside out. And if there was any man in the Bible that could possibly have earned, and often in Philippians chapter 3, I say, Paul, you know, Saul, when he, before he was converted to Paul, maybe this man, if you know, he was the picture of almost perfection, but you know what? He wasn't. Nicodemus was. In man's eyes. And yet Jesus had to tell him he needed to be born again. Read John chapter 3. It's an amazing book. This man knew it all. He all knew the whole scriptures. He knew the major and minor prophets. And yet he still had to be born again. Why? Because he comes short of the glory of God. He was a sinner. Why is grace important to understand? Grace is answers, God's answers to sin. Grace is God's answer to sin. Romans 5, turn over back to Romans chapter 5. Grace is God's answer to sin. That as sin hath reigned unto death, we receive that from Adam. We're born sinners. And if you read five, the whole, the whole book of five, it talks about the first Adam and this last Adam. That as sin hath reigned unto death, you sin, you deserve to die. You violated God's holy law, and you deserve to be stoned. You deserve to die and forever away from him. They would take the stonings and they would stone them outside the camp and they would obviously burn the carcasses out of camp or the bury the carcasses out of camp. Separated. But then here's what 
God's answer to sin is. Even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. See, you sin, you deserve to die, you deserve hell, but God's answer to sin and death is grace. Who is grace? It is Christ Jesus. Life eternal by Christ Jesus. So why is grace important to understand? We have eternal life by grace. So I'm repeating myself a little bit here, but there's an emphasis on grace today. John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. By grace, who is grace? Christ Jesus. We receive eternal life. Breaking the law, you break the law, you're guilty of all and deserve death, deserve eternal torment. God's law is holy. It requires a death payment when you break his law. Christ Jesus became sin for us and took my sin upon him and died in my place. And when I believe this, I receive the greatest gift of all, and that is eternal life. Romans 5, 21, let me repeat this. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Christ Jesus. See, Christ never comes to give partial life. He come to give eternal life. We live because he lives. He conquered death. We conquered death. By grace. Grace has no end. Look at that verse. Grace has no end. It's a, you know, look at that. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. Grace has no end. It goes into eternity. And we receive this by Christ Jesus. By grace, one is saved through faith. By grace, one becomes a child of God. When a child of God makes a mistake or sins, rebels, the prodigal son, it is by grace one remains a child of God. Not by me. It is by grace. I don't deserve to be a son to begin with. But I remain the son because of by grace. He doesn't kick me out. When one dies and they're absent from the body and present with the Lord, it is by grace. I don't deserve eternal life. I could never earn it, nor could I ever hold on to it or make it happen or continue to hold on to it. It is by grace. I don't deserve eternal life, but it is given to me. It is a free gift, undeserving. We don't deserve any of this, but we have the God, the God of all grace. 1 Peter chapter 5, 10, the God of all grace. And I think it's interesting that it has the word all in there, because when I'm studying this, thinking about this, it is we're saved by grace. We live by grace. We suffer by grace. We're disciplined by grace. We have eternal life by grace. See, he's the God of all grace. We live in the dispensation of grace. Don't tell me you can lose your salvation. We live because Christ lives. And I do get offended when people say that. It is frustrating to me. Turn over to Titus 3.7. These are three verses that have mentioned grace connected with eternal life. That being justified by his grace. Whose grace? Christ Jesus' grace. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. See, grace come to die for all men. Grace came to die for all men. And when we believe we become a son or daughter in Christ Jesus, and we have a heavenly Father that gives us an inheritance in heaven, and that is eternal life. So what is hope? We talked about it a little bit earlier. Hope is assured rest in God's promises. Hope is assured rest in God's promises. God says he provides eternal life to all those who believe in his son, what he did on the cross. If you believe this, God promises eternal life. This is the hope we have. It is assured rest in God's promise of eternal security. If I could lose my salvation, let's just play this out. If I could lose my salvation, then the epistles mean nothing. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John are all the Gospels. If you look at the layout of the Bible, there's a reason why it's laid out the way it is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, one written to the Greek, one written to the Romans, one written to the Jew. And then one is to show the deity of Christ written to all. So first the Jew showing he was the Messiah in Matthew, that he was the coming prophet. He was the one that was going to come. He's the one that Genesis 3.15 predicted. Luke, written to the Greek, the perfect man. They were all about the intellect. And here Luke writes the, the book of Luke and he shows him, here is, behold, the perfect man. Then you have Mark that's written to the Romans. Servants. We know that half of, uh, and all the, half of the people in Rome, or in the Roman Empire, half of them were, were, were the basically bosses and the other half were slaves. There's just as many slaves as there was like uh, slave owners. But if I could lose my salvation, then you know what? Anything after that means nothing. Because everything after that, you, do, you take the book of Acts. That's the history book of Paul's mission trips. The, that is the history book of the churches. Obviously, the gospel going out. Every book thereafter is about fellowship. It's about growing with him. If I could lose my salvation, I would never grow. I would be constantly trying to keep on to it, holding on to it every day. And that's why a hundred times he tells us you have eternal life in just in the book of John. The Bible doesn't make sense if you could lose your salvation. 1 Peter 5.10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory. How are we called? By grace. Whose grace? Christ. We receive eternal glory by grace, which is by Christ. The God of all grace who calls us, brings us into eternal glory by whom? By Christ Jesus. We receive eternal life by grace, by Christ. Anyone who teaches you have to earn salvation does not know grace. Anyone that teaches you have to earn salvation does not know grace, does not know Christ, and will never be saved until they change their mind. Ooh, those are convicting words. Pastor Lance, well, I just want to be real clear. Anyone who teaches you have to earn salvation does not know grace, does not know Christ, and will never be saved unless they change their mind. Anyone who preaches you can lose your salvation does not understand grace, does not understand Christ. Here's the problem with churches that preach you can lose your salvation. They're never clear on the gospel. If they were clear on the gospel, they would preach eternal security. Can the individuals be saved attending one of these churches that preach heresy? Yeah, they could. If they completely trust in Christ Jesus as the one who died, buried, and rose again the third day for their sins, they're saved. They're saved. I know of one person who I've gotten saved sitting and listening to a false message because you know why? She witnessed for herself as contradictory to the words of God. I would not attend these churches. And if you are there, I'd run fast as you can from these churches that preach a false message. And I would say, get yourself in a good gospel, grace, Christ-preaching church. And I'm not saying you have to come here. Because I know of another one in town, Sean Laughlin's. And I would recommend anybody to Sean Laughlin's church. He preaches a grace message. So if you maybe don't like the way I preach or you don't like my style, that gives nobody an excuse not to come because Sean is a great pastor. If you like coming here, I would add, then I would encourage you to keep coming. But 1 John 5.13 is pretty clear. It says, These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. There's a reason why he wants us. First John is all about fellowship. And he's ending the book with an exclamation. You can know you have eternal life. You can't lose it. How could you ever grow in grace if you could ever lose it? Let this hand you represent you and I on this wallet here represents our sin. See, God loves us. 
For God so loved the world, but he hates our sin. Why does he hate our sin? Because it keeps us separated from him. Heaven's a perfect place, and only perfection can be allowed into heaven. That's where boasting is excluded, completely gone. Now, if you want to pay for your sin, Romans 6.23 tells us payment for sin is death. If you want to pay for your sin, you're sitting here with your sins paid for. But if you want to pay for your sin, you will have to go to hell and pay for that sin for all eternity. It's his death payment. You can't be baptized. You can't ask Jesus in your heart. You can't make a trip to the front of the church. You can't proclaim him. It's a death payment. Death payment. Either you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection for the payment of sin, or you don't. Let this hand you represent Jesus Christ, the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world, God from eternity past. And he humbled himself as a man. And he lived a perfect life. Why is that important? He was born of a virgin. Key, key, key pieces here, folks. Because he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled the law. He never broke the law one time. He was perfect. And then he went to the cross and he shed his blood. And he rose again the third, and he provided the perfect sacrifice, something we could never do. And when you believe that, he takes Christ's righteousness, and he places it to our account, no longer imputed from the, from the first Adam having this sin nature. He takes Christ's righteousness, and he places a new garment over me, and God sees me as perfect as Christ, as a son. How great is that? So why is grace important to understand? It is by grace one is saved through faith. It is by grace one is to live his or her life after saved. Not for salvation, but because this is what our Heavenly Father wants from His children. This is what He wants from His children. So now that you're saved, now what? That is the question, isn't it, folks? That's what we've been reading in Ephesians and Galatians. It is by grace one is disciplined, it is by grace we suffer, it is by grace we grow in grace, and it is by grace one receives eternal life. Who is grace? Christ Jesus is grace. Once people get saved, they want to go back under the law. That's why Galatians was written. The law is created for the flesh. It was our school master that points us to Christ. Now we're saved, we're to grow in grace. So when we continue to study Ephesians here, what should our life look like? It has nothing to do with salvation. But now that you're a child of God, by grace, through faith in Christ, what should your life look like? And I'm not going to stand here and say you, life has to look like this because that is a, the liberty that you have in Christ. It is your decision. But I'm going to give you some scripture what it should look like. What is growing grace? Living a life that points to the gospel. Grow in grace is the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.27. Turn over to that. Only let your conversation, your conduct, be as it becometh. Remember, he's speaking to believers here. Speaking to believers. Only let your conduct be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Our life should be a picture of the gospel. That whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. So he can see that you actually your life looks like the gospel. And he can hear that your life looks like the gospel. That you may stand fast in one spirit, one mind. See, this is how we're unified. These are the unifications that we receive. The seven unifications in Ephesians 4. See, there's one God. One Spirit, one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One baptism, baptism by the Holy Spirit. Saved by Christ, having eternal life. There's seven of the unifications, and that's where the church is supposed to stand on that foundation. Those are things that we never split on. And those are God's words to the church. And here he's telling us, he gives us a few of these. One spirit. So we're baptized into one body, that is by the Holy Spirit. 
One mind. Whose mind? Christ's mind. Not my mind. We're in the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Together for the faith of the gospel. Us coming together, building this temple, building this body. Why? To continue to build the church. That's what the gospel is all about. It's what our life should represent. It has nothing to do with salvation, but now you're a child, perfect in position. This is what God wants from his children. Growing in grace points to the gospel of Christ. 2 Peter 3.18, it says, But grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Who gets the glory? Christ gets the glory. See, heaven will be no boasting. If I had to stand up here and say, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life, then when I get to heaven, see, I would be like, look at me. I made Jesus Lord of my life. Who gets the glory? Me. The, spoke, the, the spotlight's put back on me. That's a false message. Christ gets the glory in everything. If I can lose my salvation, where's the spotlight? It's put on me. Look at the power I've had. See, I believe that Jesus died, but you know, I'm going to keep it. And when I get to heaven, be like, boy, I worked hard. I kept my salvation. Look at me. Where's the spotlight? God focuses not on Christ. It's back on me. That's a false message. If you have a hard time understanding what grace living is all about, this verse is the formula for grace living. Grace living is keeping your mind on Christ, growing in him. How do you grow? You read his word. Colossians, check it out, 3.16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. And admonishing I had written here. Anyways. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. See, when you leave here, I wouldn't turn on the secular radio stations because it's all about sleeping with your neighbor's wife and this kind of garbage and that because now you're filling your brain with a bunch of secularism and you're going to be feeding your old nature. It's keeping your mind on Christ, folks. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. Sing praises to him. The song, the burdens are lifted at Calvary, old rugged cross. We should be running these words through our mind. And yet here we see this word, Grace, one more time in the, at the end there. Is grace in your hearts to the Lord. Recognizing that we don't deserve any of it. That I could never earn it. Nor could I ever hold on to it. And thanks be to God. I first received salvation. Thanks be to God that I could have the power to overcome sin. See, when I'm old, when I'm not a, when I'm not a saved person, when I'm a non-believer, all I know is sin. I only have the old nature. That's all I know, and that's all I'm capable of doing. But now I have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit within me, and thanks be to God that I can maybe defeat some of the sin in my life. Not me, the Holy Spirit working through me. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. And thanks be to God that I have eternal life. Because if it was up to me, I would lose it before I stepped off the stage. Those are the things that we should be running through our mind. All praise and glory goes to our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Because they have done it all. Growing in grace will improve your relationship with your wife. And husband, growing in grace will, will improve your relationship with your children, your co-workers, and your boss. All relationships should point to the gospel of Christ. How did Christ treat us? What did Christ do for us? This is the example, and this is how we should act towards others. That's what Ephesians 5 was all about. Men, love your wives. We talked about that. Women, respect your husbands. That's love. The two become one. How the church and the body of Christ, how the man and woman become one. It's not getting married today and two years later, oh, he looks good, I'm going to divorce my husband and start going out with him. That's not what marriage is about. Marriage, your marriage, your marriage should picture, be a picture of Jesus Christ married to the church. It's a picture of the gospel. That's what a marriage is about. That's what the gospel says. That's what the book says. 
I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 6, 1 through 3 here. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that is, may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. See, children are to obey their parents in the Lord for this right thing. This is the right thing to do. So now we're talking to believers. We're talking to people that are saved. We're talking about grace living continued here from chapter 5, chapter 4. See, children, you reap what you sow. If you are disobedient to your father, mother as a child, the chances are you're learning. I say, if you're obedient to your father, mother as a child, the chances are you're learning discipline. That's what he's telling us here. This discipline learned as a child will help you in your life as a believer. I believe there's another faith lesson in this. As a child, you're learning to be faithful and obedient to your parents. This, in turn, helps you be obedient to the one and true God when you get older. As a child, you're learning some great lessons that will help you in the future as you grow in grace. Ephesians 6, 4. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So why is he speaking to the fathers here? Fathers are the disciplinarians of the house. We have read that the dad is the spiritual leader of the home and sets the tone for love in the house. Those are the facts. Now if there's no dad around, maybe mom's got to fulfill that role. But the father is not to provoke their children under anger. And we're going to wrap it up here in a few minutes here. So what is, in the, what is the example of this? What is an example of this? An example of this would be coming home late one night from the bar, finding a house messy, and getting all the kids up at 2 a.m. and having them stand in a straight line and giving them all beatings because the house was dirty. This is a real example. It's an extreme example of provoking your child under wrath. That's abusing your mom and dad position. I know a young man who was kicked out of the house at 13 on his birthday by his mom. 17 now. But do you think that provoked him to anger? Absolutely. This is why he disrespects women. That's why he hates women. Obviously, he's taken this projection and from his mom at 13, how she threw him out on the streets in the middle of the wintertime, and he had to fend for himself at 13 years old. Don't you think that provoked him to wrath? Yeah. It tells us parents, we're not to provoke our kids to wrath. So who is the example? God the Father and Christ are always examples. How did the Father treat Christ? I'm going to read John 3.35. Let me read it quick. It says, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. See, as dads, we often will meet disrespect with, we will meet disrespect and aggression with more disrespect and more counter-aggression. An example of this would be my son comes home and mouths off. I step up to him and make a comment back, and I say, If you think you're big enough, we can step outside. What really has that resolved? It has resolved nothing, and I'm teaching my son to grow up in wrath and anger. Fathers, love your children as God loves his son. That's our responsibility. What about having favorites? Do not have favorites and being consistent in treating your children. This will provoke them to wrath. Does God have favorites? Did I see him die on the cross for only the white people? No. God does not have favorites. For God so loved the world, he has no favorites. He sent his son to die on the cross for the sins of the world. God desires for all men to be saved. So how are we to raise our children? We are to raise them, teach them, train them, instruct them in the Lord. How we do this, it is by our conduct. You can say what you want by walking the walk for our children is far more important than talking the talk. How many times have you seen the dad sitting in the chair telling his child with a cigarette in his mouth and a beer in his hand, you better not smoke and you better not drink when you grow up. Nine times out of ten, what happens? That kid is broke, is grazed up. He, he does what his dad does. His dad is giving him permission by the conduct that he's doing. 
Almost every time that the child would grow up to smoke and drink. Fathers, we lead by example. Moms, we lead by example. Now, maybe you're a young dad today. Maybe my son, who's maybe going to get married here, I have no idea, someday have a child of his own. And maybe you're thinking, I don't want to have this responsibility. I'm only going to be 23 once. I'd say, too bad. It's your responsibility. If you have children, it is your responsibility to do what's right as a dad. We're to treat our sons and daughters as God the Father has treated his son. And how did he treat his son? John 3.35, the Father loveth the son. It is your responsibility to raise your children with love and instruction of the Lord. It tells us that in 4, of the Lord. Telling your sons and daughters about what Christ did. Sharing the examples in the Bible. And we will close. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we just want to thank you for your mercy, your peace, your comfort. But ultimately, we want to thank you for your grace. You are the God of all grace. We're born sinners. We know exactly what we deserve. We deserve hell. We trespassed against your holy law. And we could never cover that up by our own works of self-righteousness. Yet we could try to clean up our act get the dish soap out and try to clean up and put on some clean clothes. Maybe even become a teacher. Maybe even become a master of the Bible, just like Nicodemus. But you know what? God sees what truly we are. And he sees a sinner. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to go to the cross and die. And we thank you for that grace which is Christ, going to the cross, dying on the cross, buried and rose again the third day. And when we believe the death, burial, and resurrection for the payment of sin, it is a personal when I believe that Christ died for me. He took my place. And I believe that I receive his righteousness, and that is grace. And I'm forever in the position of Christ. That is grace. And I'm forever going to spend eternity with him, and that is grace and we thank you for your grace the God of all grace and father we pray for our loved ones here we pray for Willie Tollefson who's not here today but he's a brother in Christ he's in the body of Christ and he's going through a battle right now with cancer we just pray that you be with him that you cheer him that the glory of Jesus Christ would shine through him and that maybe somebody would be saved Father, we just pray that the individuals that are surrounded by Willie, that you would open their ears this week into Willie. That he could share the light. Father, we pray for our other friends, Ronnie, that we just pray that you continue to heal him, work through him, give him some comfort, give him some peace. We pray for Terry Hansen this week, that the PET scan, MRI of the brain, that the cancer is in remission. We pray that it's removed, Father. We know you can do this. We pray for Bill's daughter, Kelly, that you continue to work through her. And we thank you for all the blessings, like Kyla having the baby this week. We thank you for that. It's what a blessing to have children be brought, and that is an awesome blessing. We thank you for the Clancy's tie that you delivered him from the respirator to him tormenting the hospital, the fight that's with him, and we thank you for that, Father. So we just pray that you continue to be with the Clancy's, and we pray that you'd be with the family here this week. And bless us all this week, and we'll bring us all back next week where we continue to give glory to you, Father. In Christ's name, amen. If you all stand, turn to page 314.
shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day. shall see, and I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand, and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Leads me through the problem.